Hello, everyone, and welcome to VM Blog's expert interview series. I'm David Marshall, and today we have the pleasure of being joined by Bill Andrews, the president and CEO of Exagrid. Bill, it's great to speak with you today. Yeah, it's great to speak with you too, David, and thanks for having me. Before we jump in, I guess, would you mind catching up our audience and just give a quick overview of Exagrid? Sure. Exagrid focuses on backup storage. So everything we do is behind a backup application. So uh, we are the backup target and we have about 4,600 customers worldwide installed in over 80 countries. We tend to focus on customers that have about 50 terabyte up to petabytes of data. Uh, and we have a very unique and different approach called tiered backup storage. A topic for another time maybe, but uh, it's a very different way of doing backup storage than using just primary storage or just using deduplication appliances. So th that's a good point. So what are customers using today for backup storage? And what are your thoughts on if the data is safe and recoverable in the case of a ransomware attack? So I, I think it's the key word there is ransomware attack has changed the world, right? Uh, before ransomware attacks 10 years ago, people didn't think as much about backup storage. Now they have to. So Forever, everybody either took what they were using on the primary storage side from Dell or Hewlett Packard or whatever primary storage vendor they had said, hey, it's just storage. I'll put it behind the backup application and so be it. Um, or they had a deduplication appliance like a Dell data domain that's been around for you know 25 years and said, hey, I'll throw that behind the backup application so I can easily just reduce the amount of storage and try to reduce my cost if I have longer term retention. The problem today with all of those is they're not secure. They're all network facing. You can get to them sometimes through the backup app, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, in a moment. Or you can get to them by finding a rogue server on the network and snaking your way to them, whatever. And they don't have the security features. They don't have the, the tiered error gap. They don't have the non-network facing approach required today to protect your backup data, which is your last line of defense. If for any reason somebody encrypts all your primary data, your last line of defense is your backup storage in order to restore it to keep your business operational. And if you can't have you know, secure and, 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 and high integrity uh, and non, I guess, uh, non-approachable storage behind the backup app, then you're not going to be able to recover. So the world has changed and you got to think about changing now what you put behind your backup app. Yeah, I mean, is it a misnomer? Does securing the backup application take care of securing the storage? It does and it doesn't. So there are many backup applications that have tremendous security features now. Um, and the question is, are they all turned on? Are they all set up the right way, right? No different than securing the primary storage. There's a, how many different layers of security do we have in this world? But people move things around and they change things and they turn things off by mistake and they misconfigure things. So there's always holes because it's, it's so much that has to be managed. And it's no different with a backup app. So if the backup app is 100% tight as a drum, 100% set to, to the uh, best practices, if you will, then the answer to that question is probably yes. But that's hardly ever the case <laughs> in the real world. And then secondly, remember that the storage is sitting on the network. So there's other ways to get to it than just through the backup app. Now, you talked about how things have been changing, you know, even over the last few years. What should customers be doing differently with their backup storage to ensure that they can recover and continue operations? So I think there's a couple of things. Uh, one is you want to have uh, some way in which you have a, a set of storage that's not on the network, right? How do you have an air gap between what's on the network and what's not on the network? Uh, that'd be the first thing. Because so, uh, uh, you want a set of storage that the threat actor can't see or can't access. You want that data to be in a way in which it can't be deleted, right? So it has to be immutable, it has to be objects that can't be modified, changed, or deleted. So not only do you want that data in a non-network facing tier, but you also want that data in an immutable fashion, right? Uh, Extragrid does additional things as well. For example, we have a non-network facing tier, but we also have what's called delayed deletes, because you don't know if I'm coming into the network facing tier of our storage, if that is an operational delete from the IT person, or is that a cyber attack threat actor delete? And until you know, you want to make sure nothing gets deleted until you clear that and know that that that, that was a 
a useful operational delete and not a threat actor delete. Bill, this has been great information already, but I have to ask, is it just ransomware that customers need to worry about from a cybersecurity threat perspective? I, I don't think so, but what else is there? Well, <laughs> there's more and more people who are doing attacks for political reasons, for anger reasons. They got fired. They're mad at the CEO because they think he's corrupt. I and mean, there's so much stuff going on in the world today. People might decide ransomware is a business, right? Ransomware, I encrypt your primary storage and I say, give me money and I'll encrypt it. But if I'm angry, I'm going to delete your data. I'm going to corrupt your data. I don't care if you get it back. In fact, I don't want you to get it back. So you've got insider IT people now. You've got IT people who sell passwords to outsider people. You have outsider people who get passwords. And in fact, it's not that hard to get passwords. So here's what everybody needs to think about, whether it's somebody's trying to corrupt your data, delete your data, or encrypt your data, is you want to think about, A, before, you know, people put out a phishing email. Somebody clicks on a link or they click on a document, and beneath that document, they pick that link. That really wasn't a document, right? And that link really isn't a good link. It launches code in the network. That code actually watches password usage. It can see the password to all of your security devices. It can see the passwords to your scanners. It can see the passwords to your backup app, to your backup storage, et cetera. So at night, they go in, they turn off your scanners. They do whatever they want. They delete data. They can encrypt data. They can copy data. They can copy all your data. And then in the morning, they turn the scanners back on. You wake up, there was no alerts because they had the scanner turned off. So what does everybody need to do? And we don't see enough of this, and we are pushing all of our customers to do this is A, you've got to use 2FA. When somebody gets your password, it is useless if they don't have your phone. So if you if somebody tries to use your password and you're at a restaurant and you look and go, I'm not trying to get in, you now know somebody's trying, you can go in later and change the password, right? So 2FA is crucial and consumers use it on their brokerage accounts, on their bank accounts, and yet corporations aren't using 2FA like you think they should be. The second thing is, is you got to have two roles. You got to have to make any change, the admin person or the IT person and the security person. So both people need to be able to log in and authenticate the change. That way, no one person can go rogue or sell something to a person outside the company that can get into your company and do damage. Because they're still, even with 2FA, they're still dead in the water until that second person comes in. So if you use 2FA and you do dual roles, a lot of this goes away. Now, we've talked a lot about bad actors. Separate from security interrupting business continuity, how are things like climate change impacting business continuity with the increase of floods, fires, tornadoes, earthquakes, hurricanes, etc.? And how is that changing what customers do? So great question. And I would say, just turn on the news. How often are we seeing raging fires now or floods and tornadoes and earthquakes and tsunamis and hurricanes and so on all the time, right? And it's on the rise and the storms, as you know, are more damaging than the storms of the past. The storms of the past. So if your data center is caught in one of those situations, you need another copy of data somewhere else. And in many cases, up until climate change, people would have a DR site with a replicated copy. And they'd say, you know, that's good enough. And if something happens to my core data center, I've got another copy out at my disaster recovery site, usually at my second data center. If I don't have a second data center because I'm a smaller company, some service provider. However, what we're getting more requests for on a daily basis is a tertiary copy. Now everybody's saying, I don't feel so safe that I only have one other copy of my data. I want to have a tertiary hop to another location. In case something happens to two locations, then I still got a location, especially because a lot of people's DR sites are in the same state. They may have one city and then 100 miles away, another city that's the DR site. Well, that's too close, right? And so people are saying, I want a tertiary copy either on another physical location, or maybe I want that tertiary copy in the cloud, but I want a third copy. Now it's 2025 and we can't get away without asking a question about AI. In this case, what AI features will help identify ransomware attacks or help recovery from a ransomware attack? Very good question again. Um, 
So we're adding in later this year, for example, uh, one that with our landing zone, if somebody starts to delete, how do you know that's an operational delete, as I mentioned earlier, or a threat after delete? Well, the AI model that we're building will start to track the deletes and build a model, build a pattern and say, geez, this is your normal pattern of deletes. Every week you purge out a weekly because your, your retention is 12 weeks and, and 24 months. So every once you reach that retention, every time you bring in a new backup, one is purging out, right? Or else you'd be keeping them forever. And so if we see the pattern change, we assume you could be under attack. We immediately add to our what we call retention time lock policy automatically. We notify you and we allow that policy to be extended because you might be under attack. And then you have to say, no, I'm not under attack. Two people log in to FA and say, OK, bring everything back to normal and take that normal policy back. But that way we can tell you you might be under attack. And there's a reason why this matters in backup. And I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, and two is uh, we will make sure that that action is taken to protect you in case until you know it wasn't an attack. You say, well, isn't it too late by then? Well, actually, more and more threat actors are attacking the backup storage first, then the primary storage, because they know if they can knock the backup storage out, then do the encrypted primary storage, you're toast, right? So they're, so if they're attacking backup first, boy, what a great time to catch it and say, you could be under attack. Everybody looks and says, boy, I am under attack. Boy, let's shut everything down. And I'm going to give you a, 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 a quick story on this. So we're in the middle of developing this. It'll ship later this year. Um, and today we already alert on large delete, but this is now going to be all AI driven. We ran, we, we have about 94% of our customers that report into our health reporting system. So our customer support people can also keep a look on everything. We have a screen when you go in, that's a security screen that says, do you have 2FA enabled on all accounts? Do you have root password security using HTTPS, right? And you read the green or red. And the support people every time say, hey, wait a minute, this thing went red. What happened? What did you turn off? Right. So we keep an eye. It's the first screen they go in. Well, they took the, 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 the algorithm and ran it across the data and saw a customer who had a pattern change because in their testing, we contacted the customer and lo and behold, they were currently under attack and they shut everything down and we saved them. So that's going to be a great feature. But we already have one we saved and we haven't even shipped it yet. That's fantastic. Yeah, that, that is an absolutely great use for AI. Yep. Yep. Well, there's been a lot of information in here that we've already talked about that uh, I know folks are going to dig into to try to educate themselves. After viewing the video, what should be their next steps? Where can they go to eat, to learn even more? Well, I think, you know, I, I uh, just to sound like a commercial here, but obviously this is what we do for a living. This is all we do. So obviously, they can go to exagrid.com, E-X-A-G-R-I-D.com. We have a lot of white papers and, and data sheets and so on up there talking about this stuff in the resources section. And if they want to reach out to their local reseller, we'd be glad to come in, give a presentation. And by the way, many customers test us. And we, we have no legal paperwork, no contingencies, no commitments or anything when we test. Uh, if you want to test the system, we put it in, we let you test it, and you can see it for yourself. And you can actually simulate an attack and see how we recover from the attack. Wow, that's great. Bill, as always, it's uh, certainly been a pleasure to speak with you. And I want to thank you for taking time out to speak with me and VM Blog's audience today. Well, thank you, David. Thank you for having us. All right.